Welcome to this week's Eccentric Minute, brought to you by Eccentric. This week's Eccentric Minute is one of my favorite exercises to do with the K-Pulley, and that is the pull-through. Guys, once you've figured out about how far you need to walk out with the K-Pulley, grab whatever attachment you're using for the pulley, walk yourself out there, and really push your hips back at the K-Pulley. From there, when you hit that stretch, really punch your hips forward, keep your chest up, and try to extend your knees and your hips all the way through. And this is where one of the major benefits of using a flywheel kicks in, as it pulls you into a deeper stretch as you push your hips back in, into your hamstrings and your hip extensors, so that you really open it up and stretch everything out in the back. This is an exercise that I'm sure your athletes are going to love to hate, but reap awesome rewards from. I really hope you enjoyed this week's Eccentric Minute. Make sure you check them out at eccentric.com to find out everything you need about the K-Box and the K-Pulley. Being a strength and conditioning professional requires constant pursuit of better knowledge, better methods, and better means. But what if there was a place where strength and conditioning coaches could learn from some of the most innovative practitioners in the world, such as Jeff Moyer, Lachlan Wilmot, William Wayland, James the Thinker Smith, and Kirwenham Flat? Well, you could find multiple lectures from each of these top-level coaches and a few lectures and examples from yours truly as well all in the Strength Coach Network. The Strength Coach Network is going to bring you well over a hundred different lectures from some of the top practitioners in the world to be your one-stop shop for your continuing education and professional development. So hop on over to strengthcoachnetwork.com slash CVASP today and get your 48-hour trial for only a dollar. That's strengthcoachnetwork.com slash CVASPS to get your 48-hour trial for only a dollar. I look forward to seeing you in the Strength Coach Network. Hello, and welcome to the podcast. Today, guys, I have the absolute pleasure of being able to sit down and talk with my good friend, Martin Rooney, about the evolution of the Strength and Conditioning Coach. You guys, after a really quick intro, Martin's going to dive right into talking about the evolution of our field, but most importantly, the education of strength coaches including how sharing, passing on, and empathy, being cool, is not really a new thing. Uh, You know, then he's going to share with us the stages that he sees strength coaches going through, along with the steps that he sees coaches going from being the athlete to the coach. Next, he's going to talk about a couple of questions to ask ourselves about how can we better be coaches for the kids that we get to work with, and this includes an awesome little tip about rest periods and, and how we can better utilize those to connect with our athletes. This is really an awesome talk, guys. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Let's get right to it. Martin, thank you so much for spending the time with us today. Hey, I'm, I'm pumped up, Jay. You know, we're always talking offline, and I think today is going to be a little... It, it, it kind of makes me feel old when you and I talk, like we're going to be delivering some old man uh, wisdom, but I know that that is probably the most important stuff for people listening. So for whoever you are that's listening right now, this episode is about you, not about us. So anything that I say that either I did or whatever else, there's a lesson in there to make you sure you don't make the same mistakes I did. No doubt, man. There's a, there's a lot I think that people are going to be able to take from this, but before we get too far into this, Martin, let's, uh, let the three quarters of a human being know, you know, who you are, where you're at, and how you got to where you are today. Uh, well, I'm, you know, I'm, I'll try to give it as quick and concise as possible, but I'll, I'll do it. To, I'll try to do like a Jim Carrey on one breath. Ready? It's like grew up in New Jersey, went to college on a track and field scholarship, then went to the Medical University of South Carolina, became an orthopedic therapist, made the U.S. bobsled team. Then as a therapist, didn't really want to do that job. So what I ended up doing was getting involved with the Precy Speed School and sports performance. We blew that thing up. Training for Warriors spun off of that. And now I got people all over the world using my program. And I just came out with a brand new book that's all about coaching. And I can't wait to share it. <laughs> That's the first time I ever, I, that's the first time I ever did that. It worked out. So that, and that was 30 years, guys, in uh, in about five seconds. And along that way, worked with a lot of NFL teams, NFL players, NFL Combine, UFC champs. And, hey, I'm a high school track coach now, too. So I've worked at every level. And, uh, man, uh, ultimately, I've come full circle. And I think the biggest realization that's really cool or maybe the biggest gift I can give everybody today is I always thought, oh man, I'm training the Army Rangers. Oh man, I'm I'm training the UFC guys. That's all I want to do. 
And now I realize maybe the biggest impact I'm making is with those middle school kids, those high school kids that are going to college. And not only that, but my biggest realization in the last few years, which led to the book, is I just love coaching, man. I, I just love coaching. I, I love being out there and coaching somebody to get a little bit better. And hopefully we're going to talk about that today. Yeah, no doubt, man. That was that was fast. Um, <laughs> but no, you know, I, I do. I think that this is going to be one of those those episodes where some of the, the, the younger people who, you know, thankfully listen to this show should probably sit down and pour a cup of coffee and listen to Uncle Martin and Uncle Jay tell some old time stories here. Because, <laughs> you know, we, we kind of came in at a pretty interesting time when – Things like this didn't exist. Yep. And there, hey, there, there was there was no internet. You know, so when I look back, for everybody listening, the information that's available now, it's almost paralyzing. But back in JMI's day, it was, uh, I mean, we make this joke, man, somebody would say, oh, man, we just got this book translated from uh, Russia that was found with the Dead Sea Scrolls. You got to you got to see it. And then and then there'd be these clandestine secret meetings of a handful of coaches that you would get together. I can remember getting together with Charlie Francis and and uh, or it would be uh, uh, Dr. Squat, you know, and and it was just you get this these nuggets of wisdom from their 20 or 30 years experience before you. And now, and it was a magic time to where now, man, everything's a press of a button away and it's almost, no one even wants to do that because they're overwhelmed. Yeah, no doubt, man. And I think too, though, that like that kind of middle stage between now and then, like between when you would have had to have gone out to Chicago for that Berkashansky seminar or all the way out to Vancouver. Yeah, I remember Canada, Canada, Canada for the Swiss Symposium, you know, which was like the, one of those biggie opening things. It was uh, so. Hey, we're trying to show. It's not like we're telling the old story of we had to walk uphill both ways in the snow, you know, with no shoes, with our, uh, you know, hundred pound backpack. But it definitely was a different day and age. But it was so rich because so much of what everybody's doing now that seems common sense was still being discovered. Like, remember, this was a day and age. I had to go around and speak every Monday and Wednesday to coaches and parents to convince them that lifting weights was good for kids, you know, or or, or that girls should lift weights too, or, or it won't stunt your growth. This is how crazy it was where I sounded like the crazy guy then to where now you're crazy if you don't do some stuff like that. And, and the, the really cool part is it wasn't that long ago. I mean, we're talking 20 years, but to see that evolution in training, to see that evolution in information, it's pretty powerful how, how fast it's accelerated. Yeah. And I think that one spot in that evolution that really was important overlooked, and I still think is the most underrated aspect of all of that was that whole forum period i mean really that's how we connected was through yeah. elite ftx yeah. and elite. all the great stuff that dave had and all of those yeah. things yeah well so i got asked that was one of my original ways where i guess the internet had just begun uh dave tate who was the uh, protege of uh, louis simmons and west side and i had gone out there a bunch of times because i wanted to learn from them and study with them hey and credit there too like that was the first time i ever saw a glued ham raise that was the first time i ever used bands you know and you know we were using chains and weight releasers too but bands were just entering in which is crazy because now every gym in the world has it you know and uh man he said hey i like what you're doing would you like to write for you know our elite fts column at q a and man every day i would get these questions from all over the world and i would spend and i'll say this it made me so much better because i had to really research to, to do my best to find the best answers and that yeah i think was that's where i met you know uh, everybody you guys tom myslinski joe ken all these people that are now friends for the last couple of decades and, and legends in our industry, it was, yeah, so that's a good point that it didn't just go from no internet and boom internet. It kind of went from books and seminars to, to almost, you could call them masterminds when masterminds weren't cool, to then there were forums that almost became like a mastermind online, to then the proliferation of everybody and his brother is on a platform putting information out. 
But uh, but yeah, that that like Dave right there, man. For all the stuff that spawned from there, Mark Smelly Bell, who now you know, look what he's doing. These were all guys on that on that forum, which is you know, again, twenty years ago. It's it's hard to believe how how fast it's gone. Yeah, man, and I think too that as that has evolved, I think it's pretty like really mind blowing how much the evolution of what we do and how we coach is as well. Yeah. Well, it's funny. You and I talked offline, right? And maybe this would be great. So, hey, for the listener listening right now, Jay and I were talking about this idea of the evolution of a, well, first say trainer, because I believe everybody, we start as a trainer first and then we kind of evolve. And then like where I'm at now, I realize I'm not a trainer, I'm a coach, but I, it took me a long time to get there. And, uh, and there's a couple important things to understand on this evolution. And we were talking about it. The first stage that I see everybody is there's you're bit by the iron bug, right? Like, so if you're going to ever get involved with this, you either lift it in your basement with your dad after you got beat up. You either uh, lift it, if you're a little younger, your high school actually did have a weight room or a gym. I didn't have that. Mine was like the basement across the street at my buddy's house. And you get, you get bit by the iron bug where you want to read some more magazines and whether it was for me it was muscle and fitness and flex you know so i'm doing i'm doing bodybuilding uh, you know arm routines non-stop to uh but maybe it's now an internet website or something got you excited but i say this first stage is you fall in love but you fall in love with exercises right you fall in love with oh look at this way if i put my bicep like this i get more tension on it oh man you know my first incline press instead or decline instead of bench and we fall in love with not only exercises, but then if we even go further, we start to think we invented some, right? So I'm gonna say this right now. I, I haven't really invented much. I would say I've tried to innovate things, but guys, if you go back to the early Greek texts, they had strength coaches. I mean, 2000 years ago, they had strength coaches and they were as famous as the athletes. They had nutritionists, might not have been the right thing, but they were doing stuff. So I think sometimes, I wish if I could go back, I'd spend less time thinking I was going to invent something that ended up not working anyway and tried to push things forward faster. So first part, you fall in love. Second part, you fall in love, what? With exercises. Then you start thinking you're cataloging every exercise you ever did, which was my original books. And then you move to the next stage of the evolution. You're like this, Jay. Then it's, you put the, the exercises together into a special workout that you name that you think is unique or something else. And in the beginning that was done, but that was world-class coaches doing it. So if you followed like Charlie Francis's tempo runs, that was to actually produce world-class sprinters. But today, like you this, my daughter got a workout. I'm not, and I'm not going to say from where, but they, we had snow here. So they had a snow day and they sent a workout. Listen to this. It was okay. Here's the workout. 100 body squats, 90 squat jumps, 80 lunges, seven, you know, and you know the routine, 70, 60, 50, 40, 30, you know, 30 push up, blah, 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 and then repeat for like five rounds. Now, I'm going to let you in on this. My kid's 13, man, you know, and doesn't have much of a training base. When I read this thing, it just was done, and I get it. It's not done maliciously. It's just done because it sounds cool or the numbers work, but there's just no idea of what it really takes to produce results. So that person in their evolution as a coach is still so far behind of understanding what we're supposed to do there. First mistake is make everybody do the same thing. Second mistake is make everybody do so much, you'd actually kill them if they could carry it out. Fourth, third mistake, uh, exercise now looks like punishment. So why would anybody ever want to do it, right? But, but ultimately, uh, you know, and hey, maybe you can chime in at this point because I got more on the evolution. But first part of the evolution, falling in love with training, then falling in love with exercises, then putting those exercises together into a crazy ass workout that you name that you want to put all over the Internet. So what do you think? What do you think of that idea so far? <laughs> no, I think that that one is actually one that probably parallels another one that you and I have talked about. And that's kind of. Uh, how do I say this? the fake confusion of the paradigm between being an athlete and a coach. Yep. Well, I think hey, that well, those are like railroad tracks. Oh, yeah. Well, well, hey, here, one thing right there, 
and I guess, and, and to throw some controversy out there, but it's not even controversy. Just because you're a great athlete doesn't mean you can coach at all, right? Like af being, af being good at a sport and coaching are two totally different fields. They're two totally different studies. Just like, uh, hey, you can know a lot about training and nutrition and that doesn't mean you can coach. So, so knowledge doesn't mean you have the ability to transfer that knowledge, right? And so, yeah, so, and I don't think it's controversial. Here's one I would say, name for me a, like an incredible Hall of Fame football player that became like the greatest coach. And like, it's sometimes hard, right? Like usually it's, yeah, every, hey, the people played football, like Bill Belichick played football, but he wasn't a great football player, but he was raised by a coach. He learned how to be a great coach. Hey, I trained uh, uh, Kyle Shanahan when he was in college, who just went to the Super Bowl. Hey, he was a good player, but he didn't go to the league, but he was raised by a great coach. Like you see how they, there's, there's a difference there. And maybe that's, and see this, that big breakthrough comes way later on the evolution. Cause I'm, and I'm going to defend everybody right now. If that offends anybody, Hey, I was an okay athlete. And I thought that automatically made me a coach. It didn't like, I've made a lot of mistakes to ever get to what I understand now. And all the things that I will tell people today, if you're listening, I only know this stuff I know because I made really bad mistakes and I'm old now. So I'm trying to tell you these things so you can get the mistakes out of the way and get better faster. That's what a coach does. So that definitely, I would agree, is, hey guys, just because you love lifting and you got big arms doesn't mean you're a good coach. I mean, it doesn't hurt. Like I'd say, you know, hey, you want to you want to you want to work out, too, and still do your stuff. That, that's important. But coaching is a study. And man, something I said there, coaching is a transfer, not just of knowledge, but of energy to get somebody excited about what they're doing. And if your books aren't filled or yeah, this would be a good example. Most people, when I say, show me your workout program, man, they got books and books and books and stacks of stuff. When I say, show me how much stuff you got on coaching, they don't, you know, maybe they got like one John Wooden book, you know, and it's, uh, that isn't enough. So there has to be as much work done studying communication and, and uh, connection and engagement, enthusiasm, sales, you know, all these different ideas as much as there is about warm ups, cool downs, re recovery, you know, nutrition. And that's what I'm trying to pioneer now is that, hey guys, coaching is a study in itself too. And we don't get one minute of it in school. Think about it, I got three degrees. I didn't have one day on coaching. And, uh, and that's where, again, like the new book and everything else, I'm trying, this. it's not the be all end all, but I'm trying to start the conversation. And I'm hoping that once everybody reads this, they realize, holy cow, now I got I got a lot of other things I got to attack. Yeah, and I think that that's something that's become even more of an evolution like through our careers. And I think that more now, like I think that, and I, I, I could be speaking out of turn here, but I think that with the people that paved the way for us, it stayed about X's and O's because we were so young as a, as a vocation and this little part of athletics that we are involved in was so like, just, it was an infant still yeah. that like, that was really what was important was like making sure that people understood three sets of 10 for every exercise. If it's a power clean, a back squat, a front squat, a snatch and a push press is probably not the best thing. Yeah. Right. Like that there are some pros and cons to things and how things need to be set up. And, and that was important. And now as not just what we do has evolved, but this next generation has evolved. I think you hear more and more people talking more and more about that interpersonal aspect yeah. and the connection aspect and the coaching aspect. And so many of us who have been fortunate enough to be able to coach for 10, 15, 20 years are sitting here taking a step back and being like, you know, this isn't chess anymore. You know, this is a, a totally different game. Oh yeah, I agree 100%. And what and how I interpret that, correct me if I'm wrong, because I think you said some really powerful stuff. I'm going to try to shorten it. Is it wasn't our fault. We were still exhausting 
the knowledge, we were still figuring it out. Like it was, you know, remember like German, hey, am I supposed to do German volume? Am I, am I supposed to do, uh, you know, uh, what's my uh, GPS? These were all brand new words where now I do believe we have exhausted that area. Like guys, we got it. And a lot of the stuff is very common knowledge. Like when I walk into the weight room at my high school, man, they're following Joe Ken's tier system and really doing a great job with it. They're running like a college weight room that is light years from where I was when I'm in my basement with sand weights, you know, doing Arnold Schwarzenegger's supposed arm routine. So in that 20 year span, we exhaust, like, man, we don't need to see another article on the deadlift, right? Like, I don't need to see another article on, uh, you know, bench press technique. Like, I got it. And that's where I think, like you're saying, and the generations change. These kids are different. When I grew up, man, the coach, it was like what they said was law. And man, when they said it, you did it. And they actually, hey, they did maybe demean you and berate you and, and didn't create the greatest culture where the, the, the people have changed. And our, our thirst for what is next has changed. And that's this perfect storm of, now I got to figure out how to get all this information across. Now, why aren't I not connecting with this new generation of kids that, that wants engagement and nurturing? They don't want to get yelled at anymore. You know, like me, hey, I grew up uh, 70s and 80s. You got yelled at. And I said, yes, sir. And I did my thing. And if I did something wrong, yeah, I was expecting to run some laps. God, I'm a coach now. That doesn't work, man. That'll be like the end of a kid's sports career. So that coaching aspect and that nurturing aspect, now emotional intelligence, uh, you know, however you want to look at it, these are the, the new, uh, yeah, I guess, uh, frontier of what we're doing there. So, so uh, yeah, so the short summary, guys, I think if you know a ton about exercise, you probably know enough. Doesn't mean don't still study it because you love it, but there's this whole other area that you got to make sure you know, or it's, or it's not going to work, right? Like here would be my example. I, and I've done this with everybody, right? Hey, so do you think broccoli is healthy? Yes, sir. And do you eat it sometimes? Yeah, I eat it a lot more than <laughs> probably most people, but. But how about this? Can you get every kid on that team to eat it? Oh, no way. <laughs> and, and so, here's no way. The thing. so here's the thing. Then there's still something to improve in coaching, but watch this. Hey, do you think, uh, do you think, uh, you know, uh, yeah, meaning because you got basketball guys. So I'm trying to find a good lift where, you know, it could be like a squat or a, a dead or a bench. All of those, depending on the guy's levers or length, things would be not always so <laughs> maybe great. But how about this? How about plyos? Do you think that's important for a, a basketball player? Yeah. Okay, and uh, do you do them sometimes? Yes. Could you? And do you think you can get all the kids to do it? Um. Physically, there are sometimes issues, but yeah, more often than not. What I mean is if you said do plyos and everybody could do it, would they do it? Yeah. But see, but broccoli, Right. they might not. So what I'm getting at is what's the thing? It's not the knowledge that's missing and it's not your expertise that's missing. There's still something in your coaching that you could like – still figure out that could get them to do it or get a few more of them to do it where the exercise part, we all got it. The athletes got it. We got it. So there's this new thing. And, uh, and that like that little gap, that's the stuff where I'm spending all my time, which is exciting, you know, cause I started to ask myself, yeah, I know all this stuff, but I'm not, you know, I, I, why can't I get my kids to get enough sleep? Why can't I get my kids to eat right? And that's when I started to see, it's not because I need to know more about broccoli. I need to know more about those kids and how to connect and how to coach. And that was the, that was the, the stuff, the genesis that all led to this. And, uh, and that's what I think we're going to pioneer next because, you know, if we're just going to be this knowledgeable strength coach, our job's going to be in jeopardy to the person that can produce better results, you know, because of their coaching. No. Uh, yes. Uh, uh a billion percent. And I, I love that analogy, especially since I'm just about to go to lunch with the guys and <laughs> yeah. have to fight somebody to eat peas. But yeah. And that's, and that's the thing you see how, so how I would say it is, okay, so what kind of connection can you make with that guy? What is it that that guy wants so bad that he doesn't have? And then how can you, what I always just do is, and then I'm going to show him how peas or broccoli is going to like Dude, then that's getting you closer to that. If you're eating this crap, you're further away. Are you kidding me? Is that what you really want? And then you've found their motivation and their driver. You've shown that you care and you've given them something to take a shot at that they're going to feel better about by educating them. What is that? 
that's coaching. And the coolest part is you don't need to know that much. Like, it's funny. Sometimes I'll hear it all the time from people. They'll say, hey, man, this coach, he doesn't know nothing compared to me, but he's got this job or this or that or this. And and I look at that person and that person's connecting, that person's getting results, that person's getting the person to do the stuff they know. And this other information gatherer, if you will, that's got 10 PhDs, but nobody likes. Yeah, like you don't get to complain because you missed that whole other area that we're talking about. So, so again, I don't want anybody to think that Uncle Martin and Uncle Jay here are saying that knowledge is not important or that you don't need to know about exercise. But once you've exhausted it, instead of still majoring in even minor stuff, more minor stuff, man, start majoring in the big stuff that you're not even doing, you know, and, and that takes courage because you got to start admitting there's stuff you don't do or you don't know. And that's hard every day. Like, man, yesterday at practice, you know what I did? It's pretty interesting. I, you know what I did? Like, it's kind of like the John Wooden teaching people to put their socks on. I went up to almost every kid at some point during practice. And I said, what do you like to be called? Right. And it was kind of funny that what I was calling a lot of them is not what they like to be called. I'm calling them their name, but that's not what they kind of like go by. That's what's on their birth certificate. And uh, and in particular, well, yeah, I, I won't use names, but one kid has this funny name and it's a girl. And I was thinking she wouldn't like to be called that. So I don't call her that. And she's like, no, that's what I like to be called. And do you see how something as simple as that, that if I don't even know the magical word that they like to be called, why are they going to listen to me? You know what I mean? It's like, I'm probably like nails on a chalkboard to them all the time. And nobody taught me that. It's like, I had to learn over all these years and you know, Hey, collegiate guys, they all had some nickname or something they like to be called. I would always find that out. Well, you know what? High school, high school kids have that too. And then all, all of a sudden you're already making a connection that makes a difference. And, and you know what? That has nothing to do with what I know about high jump or plyos. You know what I mean? Like now I'm already going to have a better chance to get that across just because I know their name, you know what I mean? And, uh, and, and for everybody listening, hey, try it out and see how it goes. Cause like, that's the stuff that I'm talking about once you have all the other stuff that you need to know. Yeah, no doubt, dude. And I think too, to kind of piggyback that, those are also things, and this is something that I've, you know, been one of the lessons from this year with, with the guys is, that like those are things that can be periodized as well like that those are things that like chances are whether it's a junior in high school or a junior in college if they have some sort of habit whether it be nutritionally or sleep or outside or whatever you're not going to change that in a day no so what can you do and what are ways and steps that you can start to improve those things? And one thing that I think has really helped them start to understand the individual process of all of it is listening more and individualizing more in the weight room. Because now they're like, well, wait a minute, he's going to take this time out or she's going to take this time out for me specifically to listen and to make these accommodations and to, to change some minor directions of what we're doing and physical evaluations or whatever it is. Yeah. And now you're talking to them about themselves with like, what time did you get to bed? Or how's class going? How can we take care of this? What are some other things we can work on? What can we do better for you? And saying, what can we, as in you and I with the athlete, as opposed to saying, what can I do better for you to make it more like you're trying to own it as opposed to we're yeah. a team well, is huge. And, and here's something I would say about that. And maybe strength coaches have never thought about this. I'm sure you have. But uh, what I like to say is a strength coach almost has the opportunity to make more of a connection than even the, the sport coaches, their teachers. And here's why. And, you know, and I'll put you on the spot. What is built in to every workout in the weight room that sometimes isn't built in as much in the rest of someone's day? And you know what the answer is? A recovery period. So like when somebody does some lift or something, they got to now wait to do that thing again. And that's when I move in, baby. Like that's when that these little, these windows don't happen, say, like I, I've always read about a, 
say John Wooden. John Wooden, like he had his uh, practices scripted out on note cards down to the minute. And he just, and like, it was so nonstop. The guys were like destroyed at, not, not meaning they were just so tired after they did it. But I, but that, that wasn't where, whenever you read about him, that wasn't when he, he delivered the lessons. He did the, delivered the lessons before in private meetings, in these like rest periods that they had, but a strength coach, they're built in, like it's there. You know what I mean? Like, Hey, on the football field, the last time you're going to make a real connection about a kid's life is like when they're running wind sprints. You know what I mean? Like you're not running alongside. Hey man, tell me about your day. Did you get enough sleep, bro? Like, you know, what's going on? But like in the weight room, this is our opportunity to make this connection. And like you said, and show that you care. So we have this unique gift. And that's why I really believe, hey, my thing is the the strength coach and the culture that they create is such an important piece to everything. And, uh, and I'll always stand behind that. But because you get this quality time, if you will, that a lot of other people don't get with them. You know what I mean? And but you got to take advantage of it. So if the coach, okay, rest, and or you know the 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 beeps go, however they're doing it, or you got the iPads up on the thing, and now it's rest period. Hey, you can also just stand there and say nothing, you know, or you can also just stand there and and uh, and just keep looking around and march around with your whistle. But man, if you get in there, like you said, and you you kind of attack it like a scientist. By the end of an hour workout, you can reach a lot of people. So, uh, you know, so I agree 100%. And, but again, what are we talking about there? We're talking about coaching and we're not always just talking about technique because once they have the technique and once they understand the workouts, what else are you talking about, right? And that should be sleep, nutrition, hydration, you know, mentally, where you at, the upcoming game, what do we got to do? You know, filling them with this positive energy. And uh, I don't know, like, again, this is the stuff I'm, pushing out there and uh and it's making a difference i never would have thought of rest periods that way i guess it's because probably for the last 10 years or so it's always been so much about what can you fill your rest periods with got it yeah well you know what's funny i see it like even hey we run tight a tight ship at the school and uh yeah, it's almost like, hey, instead, now on your rest, let's do a plank. Now on your rest, let's hold a pigeon stretch. Now on your rest, let's- 100%. And, and I get it, and that does make it hard, but here's what I would say. Don't do it just to keep everybody busy. Keep them busy. Like what I say is, that just means because now we're not coaching. But if we're coaching nonstop, then you don't need to fill it with a pigeon stretch. Why don't we, even if you say to the whole room, you know, hey, they finish, hey guys, eyes up. Hey, we're going to talk about this right now. How's everybody eating right now? You know what I mean? Imagine there's a weekly theme or a monthly theme. This month, we're hitting nutrition hard. Like, you know my style. I'm nonstop. Like, I'm going to be all over them. And everybody knows I care. So they're going to listen. And I laugh. I say it as, man, you can hear my voice is always raspy. And if I don't have veins in my neck coming out during the day of coaching, I didn't do my job. So for all coaches, here's another little thing I'd love to tell you that's one of my things that I do a lot. I do a review every night before I go to bed, right? And I always review, like, did I do it right today? Who did I coach today? What did I say? What did I do right? What did I do wrong? How am I going to do something better tomorrow? You know, and I'll tell you what, that was always and has helped me even, and I'm still doing it. Like yesterday, I had a, this great story for this kid that I think is going to be this insane high jumper. And I had this story for him because I needed to make a connection with that kid. And you know, it happens in those periods, right? Whether it's, hey, whether, and, and like I said, if they skip the plank to hear a story that maybe changes their life, I think it's more important than that 30 second or minute plank, you know? So, but I get it that it's almost, hey, maybe that's not the best thing though. Like, yes, now in our evolution that we talked about, it went from just lifting to lifting also becomes part of your cardio to lifting becomes now we're scripting it so crazy and we only get so many hours a week with these athletes inside the room. So now we got to fill it, fill it, fill it. I guess I'm challenging everybody listening. Hey, make sure you're filling it with some good information too, because I'm not saying the plank isn't important, but I am saying that I'd rather have a kid eating right and getting eight hours of sleep for the whole season because I talk to him a lot, then he's really good at the plank, you know? So that, no that's- No doubt. Yeah, an interesting one. No doubt. Well, listen, man, we can't finish this talk without talking about the book <laughs> because I do think that this is super important. And, you know, I think that anytime coaches can help coach coaches, it's 
priceless. So yeah. let's get some people some info on what what the what the book's about, Martin. Where yeah. where did the idea come from? Well, hey, the the new book is called Coach to Coach, and uh, and Jay's seeing it for the first time. So am I. I got it yesterday, which is so great. But it comes out uh, worldwide March 10th. So we're literally a week and something away from when we're shooting this. And uh, and here's what it was. I, I've been teaching courses around the world for the last decade called Coaching Greatness. I've taught it in 35 different countries. Thousands and thousands of people have gone through it. And after each course, somebody would say, man, Martin, this is so amazing. You need to do a book on this. And it never it never felt right. Like I was like, I can't write a a workbook on how to be a coach, or I can't write a how to, it can't be like, when they say this, now you do that. And when they do this good, now you give them a fist bump. And now after fist bump, now talk about broccoli. And, uh, and cause I believe coaching is as much an art, maybe even more an art than it is a science because coaching involves people and people <laughs> are, everybody's different, right? So every coach can be an artist in a different way and still get a great result, just like an artist on a canvas. And, uh, but there are these principles and an even bigger idea is there's a job description that I don't think anybody ever got. And the example that I use, and, and when I finally said, I'm going to hunker down to write the book, uh, I remembered that when I went to the medical university, the first thing they taught you was the Hippocratic oath, right? And everybody's kind of heard it paraphrased loosely, like first do no harm. So what the Hippocratic oath, that was from Hippocrates, ancient Greece. And he was the first like doctor. And he created this oath that if you're going to be a doctor, the first thing you have to understand is you got a responsibility. And if you're going to help try to help somebody, for God's sake, don't make them worse, right? Now, whatever you do, don't hurt them, right? And you know what's funny is that's the first thing I learned when I got to school. Like, hey, you're going to be in the medical profession. Don't make anybody worse. You know, like make sure you do it right. And and then they teach you all the stuff. And then you go out and you try to do your best to be a good person. But watch this. But when you become a coach, where's the oath? Where's the, like, what the job is? And no one gets, here's what happens. Most people are either an athlete and then they just jump into coaching because they don't have another job. Some people, hey, now I'm a parent now. They'll be like, hey, can you come coach? We don't have a coach for the team. So it might be a parent. They don't know anything about it. And, uh, and in any case, few people have had any coursework or really understand the job. So I describe coach to coach for lack of a better idea. It's the Hippocratic Oath. When you read, people have complete clarity what it means to be a coach, the authority and the responsibility you have as a coach. And it's going to give you a few of my greatest techniques on how to help more people and be a better coach. Is it the be all end all? No, but I believe it's the start. And if you have coach anywhere assigned to your name, and I believe everybody is a coach, it's required reading. And the cool part is it's not a textbook. It's a story. It's a story with stories within the story that you read it quick, two, three or four hours and you're done because I get it. Like we're so overwhelmed. Like I couldn't, I'm not writing some 500 page workbook that people read the first three pages and then put it on their shelf and say they love it. Like here would be an example from the old days. Remember Super Training? Yes, the, the great book that no one's ever really read yeah, all the way through. Yeah, like super training. Everybody's got to have it. Everybody's got to have it. You get this 500 page book and like, it's just a bunch of lit, lit reviews and it doesn't like, I don't know, tail anything, but everybody has it. I don't think anybody's read it. And even if you read a piece or two, what did it do? Where this is not that. This is, here's how I describe it. If John Gordon's the energy bus or Ken Blanchard's the one minute manager had a baby with the movie Rudy, that would be this book. And, uh, and Rudy wrote a testimonial for the book, which is really cool. And so did Dan Gable and Lou Holtz, Anson Dorrance, Philip Fulmer. So if you know any of those guys, uh, you know they know what they're talking about. So it's a coaching parable to uh, everything like what we said today, too. If you feel my vibe, I'm trying to make everybody a little bit better of a coach because you got to ultimately help more people. And, and I'm hoping this book does that. And, uh, and I really tried to crack the code on getting it across in a way, an engaging story that you're a page turner, that you're going to go, go, go. But maybe once a year with your staff, you're going to read it again and again and always get something new. And uh, man, it was a labor of love. It took a, a long time to get this process done and then get it sold to the biggest publishing house in, uh, in the U.S. And, 
and man, now it's here. So I couldn't be more excited. I love it, dude. And that it's an interesting analogy, which I'm always a big fan of, of what the book actually is. Yeah. But no, man. So then where can people find it? Where can they pick it up and where can yeah, they get their so hands on it? Wherever books are sold. I mean, uh, it's going to be in Barnes and Nobles if you still go out to get books, but Amazon is probably the easiest place. It's right on there. But if you're a coach listening and you want to order, say, 20 books or 30 books, there's this website called porchlightbooks.com. It used to be called CEO Reads, but it's porchlightbooks.com, and you can get amazing discount prices if you buy more, say, for your staff or uh, you want to get more copies. But if you're getting one for you or yourself or a couple of people, Amazon is the easiest way to go. And, uh, and hey, I have a special going. So if you listen to this and you buy two, I'm calling it a get one, give one. If you get a book for yourself and you get one to give to someone else that you know is a coach that needs it, and you write me, if you send me the receipt for the two copies and you send me the receipt to Martin at coachinggreatness.com, I will send you some really cool bonus PDFs that I promise you will print out, put on your wall, and you will read every time before you go out and coach. One of them is called the 15 daily exercises every coach needs to know, and another one is called my coach's creed, where every day, and I'm pointing, I keep pointing over that way because it's on my wall, I read it before I ever leave, so I never forget, this is important, you ready? The good that I could do as a coach but also the harm that I could do if I do it wrong. And everybody listening, I know you know you had a good coach somewhere. That's why you're to this point. But I guarantee you had a handful of bad ones too that you'd wish would have read this book. And uh, so if you know somebody that needs to read it, you got to get them a copy of Coach to Coach. Boom. I love it, brother. We're going to have all that in the show notes. Martin. Always great to see you. Always great to hear you, man. So stoked you're doing great and can't wait to dive into the book, man. So far. Nice. My pleasure. And if anybody listening liked this episode, write Jay about it because we just scratched the surface of the stuff that we could go over. So if you like hearing about the old stuff and how it's connecting with the new stuff or you want to hear more about coaching, write him. So then uh, he'll tell me and we'll get on and do one of these again. Yeah, man. we have our, uh, our monthly stories with Uncle Martin and Uncle <laughs> Jay, you know? <laughs> yeah, man. Nah, bro. Always great to see you. So fired up for this. And, and thank you so much for your time, brother. People are going to love my, it. My pleasure. Yeah, man. We'll be in touch real soon, buddy. Cheers. And a huge thank you to Martin Rooney for spending the time with us today. Guys, just some open, honest, candid sharing from a man who's really done it all and, and been leader from the front for for you know, a good amount of time here, really trying to help coaches be better. You know, I can't thank Martin enough for spending the time with us today and being so open and honest and candid with the sharing. And guys, listen, I, I'm getting nothing for the book. I'm going to buy it myself. I'm going to buy it for my staff. So hop over to trainingforwarriors.com slash coach dash to coach dash book launch or just go to the notes, pop down there and make sure, guys, you take advantage of that, you know, buy one, give one uh, deal because really, guys, you're going to get some awesome stuff and then you're, you're helping a great coach. And you're helping other coaches get better. Not, Martin, can't thank you enough for not just the time you shared with us today and being so open, honest, and candid in your sharing, but everything you've done throughout your career to help coaches be better. And as always, guys, if you didn't enjoy the talk, please share it through the social media outlet of your choice, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever it may be. As always, we are just trying to get the best information out there to all the great coaches that we can. And as always, guys, thank you for everything that you do for us here at Central Virginia Sport Performance. We will be back next week with another awesome guest. We will see you then.